So welcome back everybody to another webinar organized by Princeton University's Bentham Center for Finance. We're very happy to have uh, Raj Chetty with us today. He will talk about the economic impacts of the COVID crisis on using real-time evidence from private data sources. Hi Raj, good to have you with us. And he is here. He is here with his whole team. Uh, John Friedman is with us, Nathan Hendons, and Michael Sep Stepner is here. So his quarters are here as well. To you can ask questions in the Q and A box, and they will answer the questions right away. And we will also pick up some of these questions and ask them to Raj directly. So as usual, I would like to um, go a little bit back and forth what we did so far and what we will what is coming up on last friday ken rogoff was talking about sovereign debt and the role of the dollar after the COVID crisis today raj will talk about tracking real-time impact of the COVID crisis as i just mentioned on friday veronica Guerri will talk about can supply shocks cause demand shortages and then next monday philip lane the chief economist of the ecb will talk about ecb's pandemic emergency purchase program and he will outline more generally what uh, the ECB is, uh, the strategy is going forward. Now, let me give you a big picture introduction, uh, very brief today, in a sense, what is data, data analysis in microeconomics? And Raj and others have uh, breaking, uh, breaking new grounds there. There's much more data focus these days um, coming from various corners. And of course, traditionally, we looked at the evolution of data and we looked very much at past data and at a quarterly frequency. So it was a time series at a quarterly frequency, every or annual frequency, every quarter, every year, you get a new data point and then you try to forecast what's going on and get some idea about the future development of the economy. Now, we have also much more emphasis on now casting where you just try to predict the current circumstances. And we have seen from the recent unemployment reports that you know the reports change constantly. There's a huge effort in the profession underway to improve the now casting, just to understand the current circumstances rather than forecasting what will happen in the future. Now Raj and many others in the profession were very instrumental to open up the data analysis and also grow in the cross section. So instead of having one time series, you have many, many time series and you open up in a cross section of a broad variety of data you bring to bear in order to understand uh, our economy better. Now, the, the key is now, of course, that we have a huge structural break. And the question is, what do we do once we have this huge structural break? And we haven't observed some pandemic uh, the same way we have observing now. I mean, you have the Spanish flu in 1918. It's more than 100 years ago. Uh, that's really, you know, there's not so much data out there. So that's what's the challenge now is way, way bigger for empirical analysis what to do. And uh, the proposal, Raj and others, uh, propose is to look at high frequency data just around this event. Can we really do high frequency observe a daily or even higher frequency data and get some uh, some insights out of that? So let me uh, propose those or do we need models to project the future or after some structural breaks and what can we how can we combine it with this high frequency data and Raj will outline many, many of these data sources how to put them together. In the cross section, I would like to uh, label something the Roomba effect, uh, just highlighting uh, why things might be very different this time around. So I have a picture of a Roomba. My wife just convinced me to buy one. Um, and, uh, you know, when in the previous crisis, what we have typically in the global financial crisis 2008 or almost all previous crises, your households respond by cutting back on durable goods. You, know, you cut back on buying a car, on a washing machine, all the durable goods, you can easily postpone the purchase for that. And the policy response was to try to counteract this. So we had cash for clunkers. We actually have temporary reduction of value added taxes, VITs or sales taxes. Actually, Germany just reduced the value added tax from July 1st till end of this year in order to counterbalance that. But the question now is, do we still have, you know, that postponement of durable goods or not? And in this section, it seems like much more you substitute the services for durable goods. So it's like you buy robots, you go for some durable uh, machines or uh, goods, and you buy a robot instead of uh, hiring a cleaning lady. And this might actually 
that's what I call this Roomba effect. So it's actually exactly the opposite. It's not that you cut back mostly on durable goods. For certain durable goods, you might actually go into and substitute services uh, with capital goods or durable goods. And this might have permanent implications uh, in general. So because you go for more a capital solution rather than a labor solution. And uh, we will see hopefully more on that. So let me come back to the time series dimension. Uh, when rather than opening it up, what type of consumption it is, let me go on the frequency domain where we or frequency are perspective. And the question is, you know, what frequency is the optimal one to look at? Should we look at the weekly, daily, or nanoseconds? Very high frequency trading, it's all about nanoseconds. And then, you know, many interesting questions pop up. You know, if you look at, should we look at consumption payments or trading data? And, you know, if you think about the pricing of internet congestions, if it varies a lot, then you might probably look at the milliseconds or seconds uh, of internet pricing. If you buy a bottle of milk, then it's probably, you know, looking at the daily or weekly will be fine. How would you decide at what frequency to look at? Uh, it depends probably how easily you can store this good. Like electricity, it's very hard to store, except if you have better battery technology. As we have better battery technology, we can store it more easily. It might also determine at what frequency you look at the data or how frequently we price to look at uh, the pricing data. And of course, it also depends how volatile the underlying time series is. And then there's the other question. We have different data sets. Some come in at the daily frequency, other at the weekly frequency, others at a nano frequency, second frequency. How do we aggregate this over time? Do we just sum it up or aggregate it differently? So there are some time aggregation issues, which I think are interesting uh, issues as well. And I think from a social perspective, it makes a difference at what frequency you get the data and how fast you get it compared to others. You might get some asymmetric information advantage that if you get the data at a higher frequency or even faster than others, and the echo of Salaman's problem kicks in, and that's very prominent in high frequency trading, but it's also it can be also prominent in other places as well. So the frequency itself, I think is very interesting. I think there's no way around it that we have to look at more high frequency data, but that's, you know, it, it comes with new interesting economic challenges as well. We can work on as a, a theorist and empiricist to figure this out. Now let me outline, so there's of course a whole literature out there looking at high frequency data studies um, and also very broad cross section. One thing which comes to mind is Roberto Rigobon's uh, daily online prices, where he scraps online prices from across the world in many, many countries, the billion price project, which I think he started in 2008. That's very much focused on inflation, getting a better prediction on reliable prediction of inflation data. So it's but of course, it's only for online purchases. It might be very different from real price purchases. The Eric Hersk will present next Friday. So let me put a plug in for him. He will actually look at administrative payroll data. And then you get a very good idea about the unemployment, about you know job openings and all this at the much higher frequency that then the official sector might get. So he will talk about this next Friday. Then there are some other papers uh, forthcoming in the future Brookings Conference, or Natalie Cox and others, uh, they are used the JP Morgan Institute data. So what they have find or have an interesting data set, they have 18, 8 million credit card users and 4 million savings and checking accounts. What they find is there's a large spending drops across a broad set of uh, people, rich and poor people. And they're the spending drops and they essentially save it in liquid balances. So there's an increase in liquid balances of 35% year on year. And this is for high and low income households. And you know, you can see perhaps there will be pent up demand and that has very, very important implications. You know, do, will we see some huge purchasing uh, pent up demand and huge purchasing wave coming up, which has implications then for inflation forecasts and important implications for central banks. So that's uh, some other aspect to look at. Then there's some private data sources from uh, private banks. So BBVA is very prominent. They have also have credit card data across various countries. So they're a Spanish bank, but they're also very active in Latin America, in the US, but also in, uh, in Turkey. And you see they have for each class, they have restaurants, transports, and you see how there was a huge drop in March, but then it's coming back even for restaurants, it comes back to some extent. So we have that and then the other data providers like the Luan Academy has, you know, some global pandemic tracker. Uh, Luan Academy is originally founded as part of Alibaba in China. So they have a more global perspective and you can get some data 
from them as well. But of course, nothing at the scale what the Raj will present. So I just give you a little glimpse what else is out there. So the big data essentially is the economies of scale. Uh, you know, how much more data can you feed in? Of course, the production function is concave because a forecast can only be perfect. There's an upper bound, so it can't, there's no permanent increase in it. And there is also the economies of scope when, uh, you know, there's, when, when it has new data sources, there's a lot of data without any structure we can make use of because of new tools, machine learning tools, uh, texture analysis and other data comes into bear. That's a more black box approach. And it would be interesting to see, you know, what, uh, what you think about this. And that's why I would start, stop with a poll for the audience to give me some idea what you're thinking. So the first question in the poll is, as we usually do a poll, do you think private data will become more important than official data sources? Okay, and that's the first question. That's a provocative statement, or do you think it becomes equally important? The second question is, do you think that machine learning analysis with less focus on causality will become more important than traditional econometric analysis uh, tools? Um, and the third question is, do you think non-structural data like textual analysis and others will dominate the data analysis down the road? So we have much less structural analysis, structural data that will be just all data you can throw together. And we have some other approaches to in a non-structural way to analyze that. And the answer is yes or no, or roughly equal weight, or will it be fully integrated? So essentially we have a common toolbox uh, down the road where everything is fully integrated uh, in this setting. So let me just get a quick vote out there. It's a few more seconds. I think people are still voting. Okay, so will the private data sources be more important than official data sources, especially for high frequency? Uh, I would say in 60% say yes, 40% say no. That's, you know, close to 50-50, but it's, uh, it's tilting towards the private sector data sources. What's about machine learning? Will it become more important than additional econometric analysis tools? Only 42% say yes. 58% think traditional econometric focus on causality and traditional tools will play uh, an important role. So 48% think it will stay traditional econometrics. And then what's about non-structural data like texture analysis? Will it dominate the data analysis? Uh, then the majority, 56%, think it will be integrated. So it will be part of the common toolbox and papers will do both, essentially. Uh, it will be roughly equal weight, will be 14%. No structural data, non-structural data analysis will not be so important. That's what 21% think. And yes, that's what 10% think. 10 think. Yes, non-structural data will be very important down the road. So with this, I will stop sharing the screen and pass the floor on to Raj, who will launch his uh, initiative today. And we're very grateful for having you and the whole team with us to launch your initiative on uh, our webinar series. Thanks so, much, thanks so much, Marcus, for hosting us. And thank you all for joining. It's really a pleasure to get a chance to speak with all of you in these difficult times, uh, even though it's remotely. So I'm going to be presenting some new work in a paper we just released today, joined with John Friedman, Nathan Hendren, Michael Stepner, and our whole research team of about 35 people at Opportunity Insights based here at Harvard. Uh, so the uh, big picture question that we are asking in uh, this project is one that I think has been on all of our minds in recent weeks. How has COVID-19 affected the American economy and what policies can we uh, implement to mitigate its adverse impacts going forward? So as Marcus anticipated nicely in his uh, introduction, uh, these types of macroeconomic policy questions are typically analyzed using data from surveys of households and businesses. So the traditional national statistics that we all pay attention to in the headlines and use in our research, you know, numbers like GDP or unemployment rates come from well-established surveys of households uh, and businesses. And they're of course incredibly valuable, but they have two key limitations that I think are critical in, uh, in thinking about how to shape uh, economic policy going forward. So first, uh, those data are typically only available with significant time lags at relatively low frequencies. 
So for example, if you want to get disaggregated, disaggregated data on how much people are spending on consumer spending, say by income group or across areas, you typically look to the consumer expenditure survey uh, and that would give you information that uh, comes at a quarterly frequency and one year from now you'd have that disaggregated data to look across areas and so forth. So that's one issue. A second key problem is even those data sets, once they're available, typically cannot be disaggregated to examine variation across very fine subgroups, say across you know, zip codes within a city or across particular income groups uh, because of a lack of sufficient sample sizes. And so what we're doing in this project is trying to address that limitation by building a real-time publicly available economic tracker using transaction data from several private companies, uh, which allow us to measure economic activity, things like consumer spending, employment rates, and so forth, by zip code, by day. And so what we're gonna do with that data is uh, apply it to study the COVID-19 crisis. In particular, we're gonna disaggregate that data by income group, by geography, and by industry to analyze two sets of questions. First, understanding the mechanisms through which COVID-19 has affected the economy. In particular, why has uh, this crisis led to such unprecedented job losses? And then in the second half of the talk, we'll turn to examine the recent set of policy responses that have been implemented, uh, things like the stimulus program or loans to small businesses, the major stabilization policies. We'll evaluate the impacts of those policies with the same data with an eye towards trying to understand what types of policy solutions might be most valuable going forward. Now I should note, as Marcus uh, mentioned in his introduction, that the work we're doing here builds on and relates to a number of growing efforts to use novel sources of data to analyze economic activity. I've cited a small set of uh, the papers that people have written in recent weeks that have been incredibly valuable uh, here. And I will mention some other connections as we go forward to results that we're finding that are consistent with what others have shown as well. So here's an outline of the talk. We'll start by just giving you a quick sense of the data that we're releasing publicly here and the data sources that we use to construct this new economic tracker. We'll then analyze the impacts of COVID-19 on spending, on employment, and so forth. We'll then turn to the impacts of policy responses to the COVID-19 shock, and we'll conclude by talking briefly about policy implications going forward and would also welcome a broader discussion with all of you uh, on those important issues. So let me start by talking about the data. So the data uh, that we obtain are from uh, a set of private companies who very generously have offered to share internal data that they have uh, in the context of this crisis to support public policy. And so we're working with a set of partners listed here uh, starting with Affinity Solutions, which is a company that aggregates information from credit and debit cards to provide financial services. So that gives us information on consumer spending, uh, information from Wompley on small business revenues, so another credit card aggregator, but here from the business side. A set of data sets that give us information on employment, in particular of low-income workers, which is what we're gonna focus on extensively uh, in this talk, uh, earn in, intuit, and home base. Uh, we're also going to be interested in studying the labor market from the lens of job postings, who is hiring going forward, and we're going to get data from Burning Glass, an aggregator of job postings covering essentially all online job, job postings in the United States. And finally, we'll have some data on educational progress to look at the long term impacts of this crisis, educational progress of children in elementary school from a platform called Zern. So I'll talk a little bit more about these data sources as we go along, but just wanted to introduce uh, what the raw data sources are here. So what do we do? We take those raw data obtained from these companies, transactional data, and we use those to construct a set of series uh, that are publicly available now and that we're gonna use for research analysis. Now, in starting from uh, these private sector data to construct economic indices useful for research and public policy, there's several important challenges that one has to confront. The principle of which is that the data sources obtained from these companies 
naturally reflect those businesses' clients as opposed to nationally representative statistics for the population in general. So of course, we're gonna be learning about you know, what particular clients a firm happens to have. And so you have to wonder when you're using these types of data, is this gonna give us a representative picture of the economy, one that we can use to guide economic policy? So recognizing that important problem, we are gonna start from the raw data and do a series of things that make it, in our view, more suitable for economic analysis. So first, we spend quite a bit of time cleaning the raw transactional series. Many of you will have worked with administrative data. You know that there are various artifacts that can arise because there are changes in the platform or because of uh, changes in individual behavior that are systematic in certain ways, seasonal patterns, and so forth. And so we undertake a series of steps which are described in the paper to essentially address those types of blips and fluctuations in the data. Second, to protect confidentiality, recognizing that all of this information is coming from uh, private sources, we're getting anonymized data, we're then further gonna aggregate that information, exclude small cells to protect privacy, and index everything to January 2020 values. So you're seeing changes relative to the pre-COVID baseline as opposed to actual levels which helps protect the, the privacy of businesses themselves uh, in terms of market shares and things like that. Finally, to address the core problem I mentioned that uh, these statistics may or may not be representative of uh, national aggregates that we care about, we spend a lot of time benchmarking these private data sources to publicly available national statistics to characterize the group that each data set represents. And I'll show you some of that benchmarking as we go through the analysis, we're going to essentially focus on a subset of data that we think reliably tracks certain sectors of the economy that are of interest. So after doing all of this, we combine these series in a publicly available platform, which you can access right now by going to tracktherecovery.org. And our hope is that the key benefit of that platform for researchers and policymakers going forward is that it will eliminate the need to write specific contracts with various companies to use these data downstream. Now you can just directly download these data uh, at this moment uh, from this website by zip code, by income group and so forth for particular analyses you might be interested in doing. And so I just wanna give you a quick sense of what that platform uh, looks like before going on to show you some of the results that we're uh, getting from it in this first paper. And so to do that, I'm just gonna to toggle over on the screen share here uh, to share this economic tracker website, the track the recovery URL that I just mentioned. And so if you go to this website, uh, you can see this initial view here where uh, we're looking at consumer spending uh, in the United States. And so this is coming from the affinity solutions data that I just mentioned. And you can see that consumer spending is staying stable at the January uh, benchmark, you know, until about uh, March 15th, exactly when the national emergency was declared. And then you see a remarkable rapid decline in consumer spending of about something like 35%. And then right when the stimulus checks started to go out, the stimulus program, many of you will know, uh, sent checks of roughly $1,200 an individual uh, exactly on April 15th. And immediately you see a sharp recovery in spending and things have continued to go up uh, a little bit since then, such that at this point, we're about 10% or 11% below baseline levels of total consumer spending on credit and debit cards in the United States. So that is one example of the type of variable you can look at on this platform. You can also look at uh, business-related outcomes, employment outcomes, educational outcomes, and various statistics of uh, interest from a public health perspective. It additionally, and I think this is the critical feature that we hope will be of value, you can disaggregate these data in many fine ways. So I'm just gonna give you one quick example here. So let's look at how these spending patterns varied across states. So I'll pick the example here of West Virginia. If you look at West Virginia, there was a very sharp reduction in spending uh, when the crisis hit. But then when the stimulus checks went out, Spending in West Virginia recovered almost immediately to baseline levels and now is actually above 
where we were back in January. So if you were to look at the consumer spending data just for West Virginia, you know, you might think in, in isolation that it looks like from a spending perspective, the crisis has basically uh, been resolved. But if you now look, you know, just next door at North Carolina, you see that the picture looks incredibly different. You're still uh, down about 15% uh, relative to baseline levels. And as a third contrast, if I look at Washington, D.C., uh, I see that in D.C. there's been hardly any recovery at all. Spending is down still about 30% relative to baseline levels. So it's this type of disaggregation in real time, right? So you can see that the data here is going up to June 10th. So as of one week ago, we're able to see these fine spending patterns, not just across states, but we're going to show you in a second, across counties, across zip codes in America. We think that can be incredibly valuable precisely because the way that economic shocks hit, and this one in particular, tends to be very heterogeneous across places, across subgroups and so forth. And we think that can be quite valuable in both understanding what is going on and in figuring out what types of policy responses we should implement uh, going forward. So, so Raj, can I ask a quick question on yeah, that? Yeah, please, uh, Marcus. When you, when you look at the aggregate data of your particular consumption data, do you match it with historical official consumption data? Does it, is it representing the United States as a whole well? Uh, yes, so that's precisely what I'm going to turn back to okay. now, uh, Marcus. And so let me just go back to the slides uh, after just giving you that quick preview of the platform. And now I'm going to show you uh, these benchmarking results and get into some of the analysis that we do uh, with these data. So just to set the stage before I address your specific question, Marcus, uh, let me start by just starting with the national accounts data itself at an aggregate level. So what is this crisis about at a very big picture level? It's that there's been a tremendous shock to total output to GDP in the United States. If you look at the most recent GDP data that we have for the first quarter of this year, we see that GDP fell by $250 billion in the first quarter of 2019 relative to, sorry, the first quarter of 2020 relative to the last quarter of 2019. That's about a 5% reduction at an annualized rate. That number is going to get even bigger when we look at the second quarter uh, GDP estimates when they come out. Now, what was driving that reduction in GDP? Uh, GDP, of course, consists of four major components, investment, government expenditures, net exports, and personal consumption expenditures, consumer spending. And you can see very clearly that it's the reduction in consumer spending that's the main driver of the reduction in, in GDP in the national accounts data at present. Now, as oh, we just noted and as Marcus asked, we are going to be measuring personal consumption expenditure using data from credit and debit cards. And I just want to show you in the national accounts data itself that data on that's captured on credit and debit cards. So most aspects of consumer spending, excluding things like housing and healthcare and cars, which people tend not to buy on their credit cards, that accounts for about $138 billion of the reduction. So importantly, we're not capturing the reduction in healthcare spending um, uh, with, with credit cards, but we're getting you know, a, huge, a huge part of it. Now, what we're able to do when we're focusing on the credit and debit card spending is disaggregate the data in much finer ways, as I was just showing to you. But before we go there, what you'd like to know in order to have confidence in that analysis is that the data from credit and debit cards tracks what we're seeing in official national statistics. And so I want to give you a, a couple of tests of that to start out, essentially answering here the question uh, Marcus raised. So what we're doing here is plotting uh, monthly spending from the monthly retail trade survey, which is shown in the green. The monthly retail trade survey, survey some of you might know, is one of the key inputs into constructing GDP. Uh, and so that's the, the official national statistics. And you can see that it's uh, bounced around in, in 2019 and then drops sharply when the COVID crisis hits and has recently recovered a little bit. In blue, what you're seeing here is the corresponding series uh, in the Affinity Solutions data that we're working with here. And you can see that it's not perfect, 
but it overall tracks the monthly retail tr uh, trade survey quite well, actually. And so our take is for, uh, you know, the scope of this crisis where we're looking at 40% or 30% changes in spending, you know, it may not be that you exactly match every two or 3% fluctuation, but in the scale of the shocks that we're talking about, you're going to get a pretty good seg signal from this credit and debit card data. So this was an illustration uh, looking at spending on uh, food services in particular. This is another illustration looking at spending on retail services. And again, here, you know, you see maybe a little bit more of a discrepancy at the end, but overall the patterns align quite well. And so we feel reasonably confident based on this sort of benchmarking that we can now use these data to disaggregate the patterns more finely. So what's the key advantage of the affinity solutions data? Uh, rather than just looking at this at the national aggregated level, we can now break this data up in much finer ways. And so the first disaggregation that I'm gonna show you is by household income. So we're gonna ask who cuts spending more, the rich or the poor. And the way we're gonna do that is by imputing income based on the median household income that we see based on census data in the cardholder zip code. So in the affinity data itself, we don't have information on cardholders' incomes, but we know where people live. And because of the amount of segregation in US cities, you can get a pretty good predictor of people's incomes uh, based on the average income in their zip code. And so we're gonna use that to impute incomes. Now you might worry, is that gonna introduce biases? Are we confident in that sort of imputation? So here we're gonna rely on a paper that, um, a, a nice paper that Marcus mentioned in the introduction by Natalie Coxon and co-authors that uses JP Morgan Chase individual level data where they have individual level income data. And that series as of now goes up to April 15th. Uh, and we find that what we're seeing in these data based on this income imputation match what you see in the JP Morgan Chase data quite closely. So we feel comfortable uh, with this approach to imputing income. Okay, so what do you see when you break the data down by income? So I'm gonna start here by showing you uh, what the changes in spending look like per day for people in the top income quartile. And you can see here the dashed line shows you as a reference spending in 2019, and the solid line shows you spending in the corresponding days in 2020. And you can see right in the middle of March that there's a reduction in spending uh, of about $3.1 billion uh, per day, about a 31% reduction in spending immediately. And then that has gradually recovered over time such that as of now, we're down about 17% relative to baseline for people in the top quartile of the income distribution for, for high income folks. Now let's look at the same series for people in the bottom income quartile. So naturally the level is much lower here to begin with. People in the bottom income quartile account for much less of aggregate spending because of income inequality. Now, second, what you see maybe more importantly is that the reductions in spending that we see for lower income folks are significantly smaller than what we see for higher income folks. So as of April 15th, um, it's about a 23% reduction for people in the bottom income quartile as opposed to 31% for people in the top income quartile. And then more recently, uh, it's only about a 3% reduction relative to baseline levels for people in the bottom income quartile as opposed to 17% below the baseline uh, for people in the top income quartile. So comparing these two series, the key thing that you see here is that spending has fallen much more for the rich than the poor both in percentage terms and perhaps more importantly from a macro policy perspective in absolute terms. So one way to look at that is that people in the top income quartile account for more than half of the aggregate spending reduction in the US as of June 9th. Uh, and so in order to understand why consumer spending is falling in the US and what impacts that's having, it's really critical to focus on the top of the income distribution. Now, a second disaggregation I, I wanna show, we've disaggregated the data by income. A second disaggregation that's quite useful in understanding what's going on is to disaggregate the data by sector. So our purpose here is to understand why did the rich cut spending so much 
Was it because of a reduction in purchasing power or expected income or the fall in the stock market? Or was it because of health concerns about COVID-19? And so it's illuminating to look at what categories people cut spending in for that, for that purpose. And so Raj, this, can I interject one question yes, about this? So typically there's a lot of debate about the top 1% or top 0.1%. You take the top 25%. Did you zoom in or is the data not rich enough that you can say, oh, I really study the top one or 5% of the yeah. wealthy? Was yeah, so I think you could zoom in on the top 5%. It's trickier to get at the top 1% with a zip code based proxy, right? And mm-hmm. particularly for the very rich, we think a large share of the spending might not be occurring on credit cards. So capturing the extreme skew would be difficult. But I think more broadly answering your question, our sense is that if you look at the very top of the distribution, the declines are even larger. So you're absolutely right, I think, in the spirit of your question that a big chunk of this, given the amount of income inequality we have in the US, is driven by the very top of the income distribution, not just the top 25%, but the top five or even the top one. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, what are those folks cutting spending on? This bar chart is showing you the share of the decline that's accounted for by different categories. And you can see that the bulk of the spending reduction is coming from what you can think of as in-person services. So going out to restaurants, transportation, airlines, recreational activities, and so forth. Things that require physical in-person interaction, things that thereby carry a risk of COVID infection. Now, uh, if, if you disaggregate this further, you can see that you can see that even more starkly So give you just a couple of examples of specific categories. If you look, for instance, at spending on swimming pools or landscaping services, they are as high or even higher than they were at baseline uh, prior to the COVID shock. Whereas if you look at things like eating out at restaurants or barbers or airlines, you see dramatic reductions. Again, consistent with the view that this fundamentally seems to be about uh, fears of uh, COVID infection and health concerns as opposed to a reduction in purchasing power. If it was a pure reduction in purchasing power, you wouldn't necessarily expect people to be, you know, as likely to install a pool in their house or spend as much on landscaping services, etc. So Raj can ask another yeah. question, which is very interesting. Comes from Rachel Fernandez. She would like to know: There's a shift towards paying with credit cards. You might have paid with cash beforehand, or and now you pay with credit cards, and that might actually the underlying decline in consumption might be even larger because of this shift. Can you yeah. correct for that somehow or, and how does yeah. it across the categories, you know, certain things I can ship, switch to credit cards very easily. Other things probably I can't. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. I mean, that's the type of concern one would have in using these sorts of data sources. I think that's, that's very valid. We don't have a direct way of looking at that category by category. I'd come back to the benchmarking analysis we did with respect to the national accounts data, like the monthly retail trade survey. The fact that we're generally tracking things pretty well across categories makes me think that's not a first order concern, but you know, do we get it exactly right in every single subcategory? I absolutely you know, yeah. don't wanna overstate that. Uh, so you know, what are we seeing here? Uh, there's been a dramatic reduction in consumer spending among the rich, in particular in the service sector in this recession. So you can see that 67% of the reduction in consumer spending is consu- coming from services in this recession. And that is very, very different from prior recessions, where as Marcus noted in his introduction, the primary driver of reduction in spending, for instance, in the Great Recession back in 2010, was, was a reduction in durable goods spending. People were buying fewer fridges, appliances, cars, etc. And that very different shock, I think, is potentially going to have a very different Im- downstream impact on, on the economy. Uh, which is uh, what I want to, which is what I want to turn to next, by looking at the impacts on business revenues and then on employment. Okay, so the the next thing that we're going to turn to with these data is to ask how did the fall in consumer spending and resulting fall in aggregate business revenue affect business decisions? So, for instance, the decision to remain open, the number of workers you employ, job postings, things like that. And so, to answer that question. We're going to use variation in the size of the spending shock across zip codes. So the logic here is that, as we've just seen, spending fell primarily among high-income households for in-person services such as restaurants. 
intuitively, those types of services like your local restaurant, they're mostly produced by small businesses that serve customers in their local area. You tend to go to restaurants around where you live. And so what that means is differences across zip codes in average household income, which are quite substantial, are going to lead to variation in the size of the spending shock that local businesses face. If your restaurant happens to be located in a very affluent neighborhood, you're going to face a much bigger spending shock than if your restaurant happens to be located in a less affluent neighborhood. And so to understand the impacts of that, we're going to turn to data on small business revenues from Wampley and look at variation in small business revenue losses across zip codes. And I'm going to introduce that data by showing you this zip code level map of New York City here, which shows you changes in small business revenues from uh, February prior before the COVID crisis to April. Uh, and uh, the map is colored so that red colors represent areas with larger revenue declines. So you can see, for instance, here in the darkest red colors, we're seeing reductions in revenue for small businesses located in those zip codes of more than 87%. And then in the, dark, in the blue colors, you're seeing reductions smaller than a 12% decline. Okay, so first, if you just look at the legend, there's a massive amount of variation in the size of the shock across zip codes in New York City, right? Some businesses in some neighborhoods have lost 90% of their revenue. In other places, it's only 20% of their revenue. So those of you familiar with New York, you're going to immediately recognize a salient pattern here, which is the most affluent areas of New York around Central Park, for instance, the Upper East Side and so on. You see enormous reductions in small business revenue there. You see much, much smaller reductions in revenue if you go up to less affluent areas like the Bronx or over here in Queens and so forth. Show you a similar pattern in the Bay Area in San Francisco. The most expensive parts of San Francisco, the most affluent areas like Pacific Heights or the areas right here um, near the Bay, again, 90% reductions in small business revenues. If you go across the Bay to less affluent areas like Hayward or up to San Pablo and Richmond, you see significantly smaller uh, reductions in business revenue. And so more broadly, if you look across the United States, you see that more affluent areas, and I'm just gonna skip ahead here uh, in the interest of time, more affluent areas, which I'm gonna capture here by median rents in the zip code, uh, they tend to experience much larger reductions in small business revenue. So in the highest rent areas, the most affluent places in New York, for example, we're seeing 60% declines in small business revenues on average, as opposed to something like 30% declines in uh, low rent places. Now, that reduction in revenue is particularly concentrated, again, in sectors that require in-person contact. So, for example, food and accommodation services and retail trade, shown in the blue here, you see that very strong downward sloping gradient. If you look in contrast at teleworkable services where you can work remotely, so finance and professional services, accounting firms, tax prep firms, you see that relationship doesn't exist at all. So this is, again, very consistent with the idea that the rich are pulling back on demand, self-isolating because they have the capacity to do so, and that's having a really adverse impact on local businesses in the areas in which they live. So last step in this diagnostic analysis, how so does Raj, that- can I yeah. interject Please. another question? Please. Can you say something whether this demand or supply effects, do you have any insights? Does your data help us on this as well? Yeah, so just going back to what I was showing on consumer spending, our interpretation is that this is a supply shock in the sense that restaurants are no longer able to supply a healthy meal a meal that carries no health risks as they once were able to, as opposed to a demand shock in the sense of a reduction in purchasing power, the way we traditionally think of it, aggregate demand shock, reduction in purchasing power that's making people spend less. And the reason I say that, Marcus, is the heterogeneity of how spending has been cut across goods suggests that it's very much about in-person contact as opposed to a general reduction in spending overall across all goods, as you might expect if there's a reduction in purchasing power. Moreover, if we look directly at differences in COVID infection rates across areas, we see that the spending reductions are largest in places where the risk of COVID infection is highest. 
Uh, and so that's another, you know, direct piece of evidence that's addressed. It's the health concerns. The way we would think about it in an economic model, a supply shock to firms being able to supply the same good uh, rather, than, rather than a demand shock. Okay, so let me now uh, turn to the last piece of this uh, uh, diagnostic analysis showing you the impacts on employment. So how did this cascading set of shocks, spending reductions by the rich, affecting local businesses affect workers? So we are gonna uh, focus here on the low end of the income distribution, relying on the nice paper by John Grigsby, Eric Hurst and others that uh, Marcus mentioned at, at the beginning using ADP data, which shows that employment losses in this recession have been concentrated at the low end of the income distribution. And we're gonna use very fine data on employment of low wage workers from earn in uh, to track employment of essentially workers in the bottom uh, quintile of the income distribution. And again, I'm gonna start by showing you using that data what employment losses look like by zip code in New York City. And again, you see this similar pattern where if you look at the most affluent parts of Manhattan, you're seeing that 70% of workers who worked, low income workers who worked in those areas have lost their jobs as opposed to something like 20% up in the Bronx. So again, an incredibly steep gradient related to the nature of the economic shock. And you again see that more broadly if you look across the United States pooling all zip codes, higher rent, more affluent areas, you see larger reductions in employment quite systematically. Now, you not only see greater reductions in employment at this point in time, but looking forward, thinking about what the recovery might look like, if you turn to the burning glass data on job postings, we see that firms are posting much fewer ads to hire workers, especially workers with low levels of education uh, in high rent areas than low rent areas. And so that is, I think, quite worrisome in terms of prospects for recovery. Not only have more people been laid off, in these places like the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It also looks like it's gonna be harder for them to get a job going forward. That looks very different if you look at high-skilled workers where there's no relationship at all between their prospects of getting a job, job postings and uh, local conditions, which makes sense because they tend to work in tradable sectors. So uh, what is the bottom line here? It looks like reductions in spending by the rich have led to loss of jobs for low-income individuals working particularly in affluent areas. Why does that matter? Prior evidence from the Great Recession, some nice work done by Danny Yagan, suggests that these disparate job losses across regions can have very persistent effects that might last for even a decade because people tend not to move very much to other labor markets or even to other sectors to, to find new jobs. And so the fact that we're seeing that job postings are already more de depressed in affluent areas suggests that we might have a very uneven recovery across areas and across sectors in the United States unless we, we do something about this from a policy perspective. And so the right, remaining- Before you go on, yeah, stabilization please. policies. Yeah. So that Paul Josco and also Rachel Fernandez again, they were asking, you know, you see in New York, a lot of wealthy people moving out of New York into the Hamptons and other areas and actually their demand, they take their demand with them. Yeah. Uh, and you might get, some distortion in this sense. So yeah. it's not really going away, it's just moving. Yeah, so in New York, I would think of that as like an extreme capacity to self-isolate in some sense that you're just able to move to a different place entirely and that ends up affecting the local businesses in a very extreme way. I think New York is a bit unusual in that regard, Marcus. So, uh, you know, if you look at San Francisco, a number of the areas that I was showing you, you know, you look at Berkeley versus Oakland or you look more broadly at the United States, I mean, that in a way relates to your question about the top 1%. I think of that option of going to the Hamptons as something available to the top 1%, but not people at the 80th percentile or the 90th percentile. And I think this is a broader uh, phenomenon than that. So that's an element of what's going on. I don't think it's the key driver of what's going okay. on. Okay, so in the remaining time, I wanna turn towards what these data can tell us about potential policy efforts to, to address uh, this crisis. Uh, and in particular, we're gonna focus on three major policies that seek to target the chain of events that we've identified, a reduction in consumer spending that affects business revenue, that then affects low-income employment, that targets that chain in different points. 
So we're gonna focus on state ordered reopenings. Can we just use an executive order to kind of restart the economy and get the, reverse the cycle? Second, we're gonna look at stimulus payments to households. We paid about $300 billion to households in a kind of classic Keynesian sense to try to stimulate the economy. Did that work? And finally, the very big paycheck protection program, $500 billion of forgivable loans to small businesses to try to get them to not lay off as many workers. I'm gonna briefly show you a set of analyses on each of these, and then we're happy to take some time for, for questions and, and uh, discussion. So let me start by showing you the results for state ordered reopenings. And I'm just gonna show you one quick example here that I think captures the key result. So what we do here is event studies, exploiting the fact that states reopened at different times. And so I'll give you one example that illustrates the broader result. So let's compare Minnesota and Wisconsin, two states whose economies trend relatively similarly, as you can see here, looking at consumer spending patterns from the Affinity Solutions data. And what you can see is when these, uh, you know, the COVID shock hit, there was a sharp reduction in spending in both of these states. Then Minnesota reopened around April 26th, several weeks before Wisconsin. But if you look at spending patterns in Minnesota relative to Wisconsin, they're basically identical. There's absolutely no sign that spending surged or business activity, if we look at many different measures, revenues, employment, et cetera, that they surged in Minnesota relative to Wisconsin. So that is one example of many other case studies we've done like this and a broader set of event studies, which I'll skip in the interest of time, that all show the same sort of result, that these state-ordered reopenings by themselves don't have that much of an effect on economic activity. And I think that relates to the fact that the fundamental reason people seem to be spending less is not because of state imposed restrictions on economic activity. It's because I think high income folks are able to work remotely or choosing to self isolate or being cautious given health concerns. And unless you fundamentally address that concern, I think there's limited capacity to kind of restart the economy through these sorts of executive orders. Okay. So Raj, can I, so yeah, some people please, argue the close down was more effective because it's just signaled how serious this, sick, this illness is. So yes. but it wouldn't be if you have a common media and all this, it wouldn't work within the US, then it's better to compare Sweden with Denmark, I guess, or Sweden with Norway. If yes. You have uh, language and you have different uh, communication yeah, channels. I think that's exactly right, Marcus. I mean, what I think that analysis I just showed you illustrates is that the mechanical effects of reopening are not that large. More broadly, if we're able to credibly signal to the public through a broad reopening of a particular states or the entire US, and the public interprets that as a signal that the health concerns have now receded and consumer confidence is restored, then I think you could potentially have a very big effect on spending. But I don't think those reopenings that I was showing you there have had that impact. I think that's one way to interpret that. Okay, second major set of policies, stimulus payments. So as many of you know, uh, the CARES Act made direct payments to 160 million Americans that totaled uh, about $267 billion. The vast majority of these payments were made on exactly April 15th, and they were channeled towards lower income households in particular. So was the stimulus effective in increasing consumer spending and restoring employment? So we're gonna use a series of high frequency event studies comparing spending for low versus high income households to answer that question. I'm gonna start with this chart here, which illustrates the, the key results. Um, so here we're plotting spending, uh, total spending for people in the bottom income quartile in the blue and the top income quartile in the green. And what you can see here is right when the checks were sent out, shown by the dashed line, there's a remarkable surge in spending for low income folks, 20 percentage point increase, and then a gradual recovery thereafter, such that you're almost back to baseline levels at this point. For high income folks, there's much less of an impact partly because they got less of the stimulus to begin with, partly because uh, they might have lower marginal propensities to, to spend. Now, that shows you the overall impacts on spending. What I wanna to turn to next is showing how the spending was allocated across different types of goods, because I think that's quite important in understanding what the stimulus will do to the economy more broadly going forward. And to do that, we're gonna zoom in and kind of use a finer regression discontinuity design. Remember, we can see the spending data day by day here. 
And so zooming in now, every dot here is a different day. And you can see that exactly on April 16th, as opposed to April 14th, there's a 26 percentage point jump in spending for people in the bottom income quartile right when that money hits. So very clear evidence of a, a strong impact. If you do the same thing for the highest income quartile households, you see a much smaller impact of nine percentage points. Now, more importantly, if you look at what people were spending on, uh, the vast majority of that increase in spending was on durable goods and not on in-person services. So if you look here at in-person services, that only increased, spending increased a little bit after the stimulus checks went out. Uh, and so, you know, what, that, what that's showing you is, uh, you know, related to what Marcus was asking earlier, the spending reductions occurred primarily in certain categories that required in-person contact. But the recovery in spending did not undo those reductions, right? It occurred in different categories. It went to an increase in spending on durable goods like appliances and so forth. And so, you know, it's kind of like your Roomba example. When you send the stimulus checks out, you don't necessarily fill the holes that were created by the COVID shock to begin with. The money is not going back to the businesses that lost revenue to begin with. It's going to a totally different set of businesses like Amazon and Walmart and so forth. And so that I think can potentially have important implications for the economic recovery. Again, you know, might hamper, at least delay the process of adjustment because workers have to switch sectors and so forth. So one other quick thing in that vein, and I know we're running short on time here, so I'll, I'll wrap up uh, very soon. Um, you see a very similar pattern spatially. So we see a big surge in spending in the lowest rent quartiles, so the, the less affluent areas. But if you look at the more affluent areas, which remember is where businesses were hit hardest, they are not actually getting more revenue as a result of the stimulus because high income folks are not increasing spending as a result of the stimulus. And so, you know, the bottom line for, from this is that our sense is the stimulus was effective in increasing total spending, but we find it, you know, did not undo the impacts of the shock. And as a result, may end up having limited impacts on employment, at least in the short run, because of uh, workers would have to switch sectors or move to different areas to, to get those new jobs. So if I can just take two minutes to, to wrap up. take another five minutes. I just want to interject a yeah. uh, uh, question. So Vivichari would like to know why is it April 15th? People anticipated already that there will be this check coming and they might have started spending already in advance. Uh, are you surprised yeah. that you find such a strong result only after the checks were sent out? Yeah. I mean, th that's right, Chari, you know, I think that's a, in a neoclassical model, you would expect people to be forward looking and if they were not liquidity constrained, they, uh, you know, would respond earlier. I think these graphs are quite sharp in showing that in fact, people are uh, either liquidity constrained or myopic. That's an empirical result that I think is very clear in the data. It's exactly when the checks hit, not when the announcement was made that the checks were going to go out. And that result itself, I think, is consistent with other evidence from Scott Baker and other folks who've been working on these issues. And I think is of interest in thinking about uh, how we should be modeling uh, this crisis from a macro perspective. And, and the other question is for John Hartley, is that oh, there were all these other components, oh, Fed QE and all the other things. Are you attributing too much just on this sending the checks out and the other effects might have you know, contributed to a large extent too and came around the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think that's totally reasonable. I, I, I would be surprised if they would lead to this exact jump. I mean, if you go back to the first graph I showed you here, exactly on this day, this is why I think the high frequency timing that's feasible with these data is quite illuminating. If I'd shown you this graph at kind of a monthly frequency and showed you a jump, I think it would be very hard to tackle that question. I think it's harder. Why would the QE have had an effect exactly on April 16th as opposed to April 14th, right? Um, Okay, so last piece, uh, the, the other major thing we did, loans to small businesses. So the CARES Act provided about $500 billion in loans to, to small businesses starting on April 3rd. Those loans critically were forgivable if payroll was not reduced significantly relative to pre-COVID levels. So in other words, you got to keep the money if you didn't lay off too many workers. Now, what we're gonna exploit in trying to understand the impacts of this program is that firms with fewer than 500 employees were eligible 
for these loans. For the most part, I'm simplifying here, there are some exceptions to that that we deal with. Um, so what we're gonna do is compare trends in employment with, for firms with less than 500 employees to trends in employment for firms with more than 500 employees around April 3rd to assess, you know, did we see the firms that were likely to have received these loans at a higher rate? Did they start to increase employment after April 3rd? So again, I'm just gonna show you a very simple plot here from the earn-in low-income worker employment data. And so I'm gonna start here with a set of smaller firms that have about 100 to 500 employees on average that would have been eligible for these loans if they chose to take them up. And this is showing you employment trends for those firms. You can see a pretty steady decline. April 3rd here marks where, where the checks went out. Now I wanna compare that to firms that we think are likely to be above the threshold for eligibility, firms with about 1,300 employees on average. And you can see here, if you compare the purple to the green, that the trends are basically indistinguishable uh, after April 3rd relative to, to before. So before April 3rd, they track each other super closely. And after April 3rd as well, there's very little evidence that spending went, sorry, that employment went up in the firms that would have been eligible for the PPP loans relative to the, the firms that were not. So I think that's disappointing from the perspective of, you know, hoping this program had a significant impact. You can look at that in various ways. I'm gonna skip those details for, for now. You can look at that in the paper. Uh, we see very similar impacts looking at, at various subgroups. And so you might ask, okay, we spent, we actually sent out $500 billion here. How did we still end up having quite a limited impact on employment? I think the one way to think about this is that the businesses who took up the loans may not have intended to lay off their workers to, to begin with. So in other words, the, the spending might've been totally inframarginal. So for instance, to give you a concrete example, we see a very high take up rate of the PPP loans among firms that were providing professional and scientific services, despite the fact that even before April 3rd, there were very few job losses in that sector. So in a sense, you know, for firms in that sector, they were able to maintain employment because they were able to provide their services remotely. And this is essentially free money from the government. So why not take up those loans? And so I think that's quite consistent uh, with some evidence from uh, Eric Zwick and co-authors in a nice paper that shows that geographically, the loans also don't seem to have been targeted in the right way. They seem to have flowed to areas with smaller employment losses. So let me conclude by uh, talking about some of the potential longer term impacts of this crisis and uh, uh, what, what we think going forward in terms of policy implications. So here we have focused primarily on the short term impacts of the COVID crisis on spending and employment. And of course that's top of mind for most of us at the moment. But I just wanna end by emphasizing that this shock might have lasting impacts going forward on inequality and social mobility, which is the core focus of our, our research group. And so to illustrate that quickly, I wanna show you some data on educational progress on an online math platform that's used as part of the school curriculum by about a million students across the United States. And so what this chart is showing you is the number of math lessons that kids in like third to fifth grade are completing on this math, online math platform by their household income quartile. And what you can see is that for kids who live in houses in the top income quartile, after the COVID shock hit, there wasn't that much of a reduction in the amount of progress that they were making in terms of learning math. But if you look at kids in the middle income quartile or the bottom income quartile, you see a drastic drop off, something like a 60% reduction in the number of lessons completed. And you know, that I think is a small illustration of potentially a much broader worrisome phenomenon which is that the impacts of this crisis might be disparate, not just in the present moment, but going forward in the long run, you know, potentially changing what inequality looks like uh, years or, or decades from now, I think something important uh, to, to keep an eye on. So to end, you know, what's the bottom line from the various set of results we've uh, shown you here? Uh, our read is that there's limited capacity to restore consumer spending via traditional economic tools in the midst of, uh, of the pandemic. The impacts of stimulus and loans to small businesses might be blunted when spending is fundamentally constrained by health concerns. And so at some level, the long-term solution really lies in addressing the virus itself 
via public health efforts, finding a vaccine, et cetera. In the meantime, what does that mean for economic policy? We think it, it makes a lot of sense to focus on how we can limit hardship among low-income workers who've lost their jobs by extending unemployment benefits, extending the social safety net in other ways, uh, rather than sending, sending stimulus checks to all households, you know, focusing resources on people who've specifically lost their jobs and lost income. Going forward, then, there may also be a role for place-based policies that target recovery in the hardest hit areas. So for instance, low-income workers in affluent counties. And lastly, as I was briefly mentioning at the end, we think it's very important to take into account the potential long-term scarring impacts of this crisis, for instance, in thinking about the decision of whether you reopen schools versus businesses uh, first. So, uh, you know, more broadly, uh, I've focused here on the immediate impacts of the, of the COVID crisis, but the broader thing that we're hoping to, to convey here, coming back to Marcus's introduction, is that we're hoping these types of private sector data that we've assembled will provide a new tool to support economic policy in the age of big data, to target aid more effectively and diagnose what the root causes of economic failure are more rapidly. And so the way we're thinking about this is that you can think of the tracker that we've constructed, the data we've put together, as a very rough first prototype for sort of a system of real-time national accounts, much in the way that Simon Kuznets, if you go back to 1941, the context of the Great Depression, um, you know, that was the origins of the current system of national accounts based on surveys that we all rely on. We're hoping that these types of administrative data can provide a platform for that going forward. And in the meantime, a platform for supporting all of your research and policy efforts. All of the data that we've been showing you here today to, to construct these results are freely downloadable at this platform, uh, track the recovery. Org. So let me end there. And I just want to end by thanking the big team of folks that helped put this all together in the past two months, about 40 people on our team uh, at Opportunity Insights who've really done an exceptional amount of work to start from having no data to putting this together uh, in the past two months. And so we're very grateful for those efforts, grateful to all of you for listening and happy to take any final questions, Marcus, or, or end it there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Raj. Fascinating talk. And uh, I applaud you for doing this and the whole team, uh, as you said, it's for putting all the effort in and making the world a better place. So there's a lot of questions here. And I just want to summarize some of them, the big point questions. The first one is, and that came up many, many times, what are the direct implications for developing countries? Can you draw some lessons for them? And the second question concerning developing countries is, Similar efforts could also be done in developing countries as well or emerging economies. Uh, do you see other groups doing similar data efforts, let's say for other countries and you know everything becomes more digitized, payment systems become more digitized, or do you see more obstacles to do it in other countries? Yeah, those are both uh, great questions and I'm going to invite my co-authors, uh, John, Nathan and Michael as well to, to jump in here to yeah. share their thoughts. Um, let me take the second one first on data efforts. Yeah, I mean, I think this type of approach of using private sector data uh, is certainly feasible in developing countries, right? If you think about mobile phone technology, credit card payments, all of those things are, you know, to a substantial ex extent feasible in developing countries uh, as, as well. Although there might be more limitations, like for example, your cash economy question, of course, becomes much more salient in a developing country. But we think those efforts would be uh, extremely valuable and we'd be interested in hearing from folks who are, uh, are interested in pursuing those efforts. Some of our data partners actually have an international presence and so there might be direct ways to, to do that immediately. So while our team's focused on the US, we're very happy to support others doing similar work in other contexts. On the first question, you know, the economics of this in the developing country context, you know, I'm by no means an expert on that. I would think a lot of similar mechanisms would be at play, perhaps in an amplified way because the public health concerns, the ability to address the public health concerns is more limited. The ability to work remotely is more limited. limited. The trade-offs that people are facing, right? So when we have a social safety net, we can enable lower income folks if they're not essential workers to stay home and avoid public health risks in a developing country context where those resources are not available, the trade-offs become much more stark. And I think these issues become uh, even more uh, important. So I don't know if John, Nathan, others, you wanted to add something there. Uh, 
But if not, Marcus, back to you. So then let's move to the next question. John and Nathan can also jump in. Uh, so Gregory Rosalski from uh, NPR Money uh, Planet would like to know the bigger insights. Do you have any bigger insights on universal basic income on that? Um, you know, can you draw lessons that we should have a more guaranteed income or universal basic income? Or is this going too far? We're just drawing this direct conclusions for UBI. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the debate over UBI, there's an enormous literature here and there are a lot of concerns uh, that you know, we can't address. I think the stimulus payments that Rod showed those graphs of are perhaps the most similar, not quite universal basic income, but, um, and it, you know, certainly those payments, uh, I think, did a lot of work in supporting many households with declining incomes in April. Um, you know, whether we want to continue to have that type of very broad support going forward, or we more want to focus on uh, more targeted uh, supports, either for uh, households that have lost income or for households and businesses in particular areas where the shock has been particularly large. Uh, I mean, I think that's a trade-off that involves both kind of economic efficiency and welfare and, and um, political factors that I'm not sure um, I'm going to have too much to help unpack. But I think certainly the evidence on the, the stimulus does suggest the limitations in this particular context of that type of very, very broad-based uh, stimulus package. Okay, Nathan, do you want to jump in or I give you the next question? Or So the next question is, you know, there's health uncertainty and then there's economic uncertainty. Does your data allow you somehow to separate the two things? So it, it seems from your, the way you, your results is that uncertainty plays a major role. And this uncertainty leads to uh, less demand or supply the way you want to feel. Either you say the demand for healthy restaurants is going, is uh, supply is, is down, demand might still be high, but there's no supply or there might be some demand as issue as well. Um, so the question is a little bit, is it more the uncertainty of the health side or is it more the uncertainty on the economic side. Of course, we have to fix the health side first, but uh, is there any lessons you, you can draw from that, from your data analysis? I think one of the biggest uncertainties is when will we uh, resolve the uncertainty on the economic side is when do we resolve it on the health side? Um, and I think, you know, as well said, you know, I think we can think of this as sort of a, a, a cost imposed on the production of safe uh, restaurants and, and in-person goods. Uh, that you can reduce through, you know, other means like a vaccine or through testing that's that's more expansive that reduces the health side uncertainty. Um, how that spills into the economic side of the uncertainty, you know, we've got some of the, the data on job postings from burning glass and other things like that that might get a little bit more at that one kind of the longer run patterns in the in the labor market and kind of what people who are losing their jobs look like. I think there were some comments that we were uh, the, addressing in the side chats here about to what extent your workers can be recalled. There's a lot of uncertainty that will be resolved in the coming months that I think will be important on those fronts. But um, at this stage, we, uh, uh, I think it's too early to really say. Then I have a final question, which is, uh, is a big question. So I very much applaud your initiative, collecting the data, bring, bring a lot of private uh, sector data together and making it available to all researchers and also to the public. In the long run, should this service be provided by the government? Should the, the official sector step in or not? Is it like, you know, the pioneering work has to be done now more on, on the university level and all this, but do we have to reshape our national accounting? Uh, and, you know, also for other countries, uh, what's your take on, on that? Yeah, I'm happy to take that and if others want to jump in as well. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you raised that, you know, at the end here, Marcus, that is, where we're hoping this will be headed. Uh, I don't think in the long run, the, the natural solution here is that you have one research team or some group you know, uh, providing these data. I think that makes a lot of sense as a, as a prototype to kind of test things out as we're doing here. And I hope people will see this as kind of a proof of concept or a demonstration that there is some information in these data. It may not be perfect and we can improve on it, but there is some information in these data that we can glean that we can't currently get out of the national accounts. And once we see that, and we see that these data sources are here to stay, um, can we figure out a way to work with government agencies, other private companies, as well as the ones we're currently working with going forward to set up a stable system uh, 
where if you think back to what Kuznets did, you know, in the 40s, they essentially decided to institute a set of monthly surveys, like the monthly retail trade survey, which 13,000 firms in the US fill out every month as a service to the public to give information about their sales that ends up creating GDP and all these other statistics that we rely on. And so our vision is that going forward, rather than just responding to those surveys, we also see firms supplying in an anonymized aggregated way uh, administrative data from their records that can help us create much more precise national accounts, not to replace the existing survey measures, but to complement them in the ways that we emphasized, much higher frequency, more real time, can be disaggregated in much finer ways. And we'll be working toward that goal on our team and it would invite anybody else on the call who's interested in joining that effort through data sources you might have access to or an interest in contributing to what I see as a broader public good uh, for the US, you know, that'd be very welcome, that'd be fantastic. And you, you see the digital world not moving fast, it's moving a lot. So the pioneering phase might be quite some years now because our economy might look in 10 years very different. We might have a very, very different world from today. So there's always a lot of, you know, initial pioneering work necessary, I think, for the next decade. Do you agree with that? Or is it, is it already stable enough, our digital environment, that we can actually move to a more stable system? Well, I think one thing is that the shift toward the digital environment has actually changed the distribution of who has information about the economy in the United States. So it used to be that the government had vastly more information than any other any private sector company could provide. Uh, and as more and more companies are building large databases and really using this data to make their own internal business decisions every day uh, and every week, uh, we've seen a shift where now far more data is held in the private sector than in the public sector. And I think one thing that we're hoping our efforts will highlight is the value of that data as a public good and hopefully on, inspire both the private sector and the public sector to recognize that and come together to uh, basically join forces and use that data going forward to provide the economic statistics that are so valuable for public policy. Thanks a lot, Michael. So we typically have the tradition in this webinar series that we end up with a positive note. Um, we can leave this as a positive note that we will have a way better data a system down the road and we'll do much better economics. Or if, Raj, if you want to add some final sentence, uh, you can also add something. But I think that's already a nice positive note. Well, I, I think data, I always find data, more information to be a positive note. So I'm happy to, <laughs> to uh, end it there. I mean, I will maybe say one thing from an economic perspective and would invite others to chime in. But uh, if you look at the economic tracker, one thing that we're seeing that we find somewhat encouraging, if you click on job postings, you'll see that there's been a dramatic uptick in job postings just in the past week or so. Uh, and I think, you know, based on prior work on the beverage curve in macroeconomics and the link between job postings and unemployment, hopefully that's a sign that things are looking up from an economic point of view, even though at the moment we're seeing tremendous job losses and so forth. Now, as we emphasized, that could still be quite uneven across areas and so forth, but at the least we're starting to see some indications uh, of a rebound. And so that's, I think, a positive note uh, in, in the data itself looking forward. So then I would like to thank the whole team for putting this great work together and working so hard. And also our, our listeners for staying with us for extra 22 minutes, uh, but it was worth it, I think. And um, I hope to see you again on Friday with Veronica Guerri talking about demand and supply, figuring out what's a demand shock, what's a supply shock, and how everything is intertwined these days. And thanks again, and hope to see you all soon again in the real world. Thanks, thanks so much, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.